66% of Americans are sports fans. <laughs> it's an insane number of people. There's 350 million Americans. Live sports is it. I mean, you've got to have traditional television, and then you've got to have Netflix. The fact that Netflix sees that value in live play-by-play -play sports and has invested billions of dollars in it. Amazon has invested billions of dollars in it. Uh, all of these platforms that are in constant pursuit of the best content are all going after live sports content because they see the value in it. And live sports is the one place where you're going to sit through and have to watch commercials. And again, the fact remains like it's active listenership. It's active watching. You know, if there's a big play coming up. You're not going to leave the TV. You're not going to get up. So these people are sitting on the couch on a Sunday for hours on end. And I'm not getting up and I'm watching your message. Hello and welcome to Tuesdays with Morrissey, where we share insights from great thinkers. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Ari Temkin. Ari has hosted many radio shows in the sports world, including the Dallas Cowboys pre- and post-game show, currently Big 12 today on TuneIn Radio. And he's also the affiliate manager for brand partnerships for the Chicago, LA, and New York sports team radio networks. Ari, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. I appreciate it. I'm excited to have a conversation about sports and media, how they're changing and why it matters. But before we do that, I'm curious, how do you balance hosting radio shows and also the brand partnerships for the networks for those major uh, markets? Yeah, you know, I've, I've been in a position in my career um, to sort of balance multiple full time jobs at the same time throughout. And I think in media, especially in in spoken word media, you kind of have to in order to make it work with kids and a family. Um, <laughs> you know, I. There's such a demand for people to have these jobs. So the pay for them can be, you know, low in a lot of cases. Yep. Um, you know, in my case, I've, I've been able to, to get to a higher level, but still. Um, so yeah, you kind of get used to it. We're in multiple hats and, and I love it because I think it, you know, it keeps me busy and, and, and I, I love to learn new things. You know, I'm, I become comfortable being uncomfortable. And so I love to kind of get myself out of my comfort zone to learn new things and, figure out different aspects of the business and, and, and the radio business in general. So I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I imagine when you're starting off for sure, it's a little bit kind of like working in the advertising industry because you're compensated with sports tickets and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, when you first get started, it's like, you're just happy to be there, you know, and, and, oh, wow, you get to talk sports. And so then you wake up five, 10 years down the road and you're like, wait, I should probably be making more than minimum wage at this point. And, you know, and so, I mean, it's, it's, I remember finding out early uh, when I was an intern, uh, I got some great advice. And one of the pieces of advice I got was like, it's, it's sort of a battle of attrition. You know, you just got to stay in it and the longer you stay in it, the better you're going to be and the better off you're going to be. But a lot of people, they don't want to stick, stick in it and they don't want to stay in it and they want to stick it out, you know? And so they go and pursue other endeavors and other opportunities. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's definitely a battle of attrition, Adam, for sure. So much has changed in sports and media over the last 10 years. You know, you have the rise of streaming, social media, non-traditional media outlets like Barstool. Everyone expected things to change, but I don't think anyone would have predicted exactly how it sh shook out. Yeah. If you had to explain to an expert from 10 years ago that was making predictions about what it would look like in 2024, what would you tell them they got right and what they got wrong? Man, that's a great question because I think, Adam, you hit the nose on the head, uh, the nail on the head there in terms of, you know, so like what Barstool's model is, is a really good example of what a media company needs to do today in order to survive long term. And, and I say that because, you know, Barstool Sports is almost like a bunch of individual contractors that are all major influencers. And so they found funny, poignant, interesting um you know, influencers across sports media, across all kinds of media spaces, and then brought them into their umbrella. And so they bring their audiences with them. And so I think in trying to explain that to somebody, you'd have to almost start to explain what influencing is and what influencers are in sports talk radio. You know, we, we were in some ways the original influencers as radio hosts and, you know, endorsements, you know, that's such a huge part of, of making substantial income in sports talk radio is getting those endorsement opportunities where you can make, you know, six figures on those over the course of a year. Right. So like, that's the original influencer is talking about your car that you're driving or, you know, this new place you went to, or this rest, whatever it is, like that's the original influencer. And so I think it's very translatable to all forms of media. Um, you can look at YouTube. YouTube is very similar currently 
to what sports talk media is. It's it's obviously a visual medium, but it's very much spoken word and, and influencer based. So, um, yeah, I think you can almost tell somebody from 10 years ago, look at what sports talk radio is. And that's a sort of what most people in media are going to aspire to be doing, whether it be in digital platforms like a YouTube or is, is you know, a media outlet like like Barstool. Talk a little bit about radio and where it is today. A lot of people were expecting radio to be, I'd say, the first to die. Yeah. If you're looking at the traditional channels, why do you think it was able to hold on? Yeah, when when I think you know digital media started becoming big, Adam. Um, you know, the, they looked at the big three of of newspaper, television, local TV, local news, and radio, and most people expected radio to be first to go. And as it's turned out, you know, newspaper, local newspaper is dead. Local TV, for the most part, is dead. And radio still stands above them all. I think a lot of it goes back to what we were just talking about, which is, you know, look at YouTube and you just just digital content as a whole. It's very much spoken word. Again, there's a visual component to it, but it's people talking first person into the camera. It's talking about what's going on in their life. It's talking about what's going on in the world. It's talking about the things that you expect them to talk about based on your following that influencer or that type of content, right? So that's that's all spoken word. And so it's it's theater of the mind in a sense. And so I think the longevity of radio has a lot to do with the fact that it it's it will exist no matter what the medium is, just it perhaps in, in just in different capacities, right? In different iterations. But in terms of like the actual medium of radio itself. So it's like it's easily translatable to digital. So many radio companies now consider themselves quote unquote media companies. You know, Good Karma Brands used to be Good Karma Broadcasting, a Good Karma Radio, and it's not anymore because every every outlet we have, you know, is its own entity unto itself. Where you've got you know YouTube and Twitter and Instagram, and then you've got different audiences with different content being fed in those different channels. And it all goes back to the kind of the middle of the spoke the wheel, the the spoke of the wheel, if you will, which is the radio product or the radio talent involved there. So, um, you know, obviously radio still being in cars is huge. You know, until we have automated cars, they're driving themselves. People are still going to ha- not be able to, to watch content. You've got to listen to content. And there is a beauty behind it. You know, there really is a beauty behind theater of the mind, right? I mean, we are inundated with digital content and watching things. And so I think being able to close your eyes and picture something, um, hearing sound effects or hearing different, um, you know, d- different components of that is all a part of uh, of what makes it attractive. So I think there's longevity in radio, even if, even if it doesn't exist in the capacity that it currently exists in. Um, and you know, and and as far as as radio in terms of cars or driving, until we have automated cars, until we've got cars that drive themselves, where we could sit back and watch. <laughs> We're yeah. still going to be listening to the radio at some capacity. And you'll probably be watching people talk about stuff. Right, right. It'll, um, it'll, it'll exi- you'll just be watching it as opposed to listening to it. It's less theater of the mind in that way. Yeah. You're, you have recently launched the Big 12 Today show on TuneIn Radio. Like, What went into standing up that show, especially with all the stuff that's going on in the Big 12? Yeah. So for you know, for your listeners that are not huge college sports fans – you know, so the Big 12 conference, like the Southeastern Conference, the Pac-12 Conference, which used to exist, <laughs> and the Big Ten Conference, the Atlantic Coast Conference, college sports have undergone a dramatic and massive shift and change. You know, we, we, we can simplify it or say like, oh, it's, it's, it's just about money. And it is, but it's always been about money. I think m- now more so because sort of the gloves are off where now you have the athletes themselves are able to monetize and make money. And so I think other ways in which college athletics used to maybe shy away from monetizing, they figured out that that's, that, that's all off the table now. And so all bets are off. Um, and that's where you saw a dramatic shift where television revenue became so important and such a large percentage of your total operating revenue and, you know, operating expenditures, um, and, you know, and, and responsible for operating expenditures. So that led to massive consolidation. So we've seen multiple rounds of that, which led to the latest, which is what we've seen now across college athletics right now, which is you may be a college football fan and turn on a game and be like, oh, they're in that conference. Like I, I've worked within the big 12 for the last six years, first with Sirius XM and now with tune in radio. And I can't even, it's hard for me to tell you all the teams of the big 12. Like we're going to spend the next decade trying to figure out who's in one conference. Like that's the massive joke here because you've got Cal 
you know, in the right, right on the <laughs> Pacific coast that's playing the Atlantic coast conference. You've got a big 12 conference that expands now four different time zones because Arizona's in that weird time zone all, all to itself. So that's like what, like mountain standard and mountain, whatever Arizona's in. So like, it, it's just, it's bizarre to see West Virginia and Arizona state at the same conference, which is what you have in the big 12. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's a shift there. And I think when you look at like so, an entity like Sirius XM, an entity like ESPN, they've done massive investments into the SEC because there's so many eyeballs. There's so much listening and people paying attention to the SEC, which has led to, you know, there being less attention drawn to some of these other conferences, the ACC and the Big 12 in particular. And so uh, tune in, saw a massive opportunity there to, you know, to, to, gain an audience tune in forever has been sort of aggregating content across different radio stations. Now they've, they have, you know, Garth Brooks has three channels of tailgate radio. So they've got music sure. radio, but this is the first iteration of talk that's been produced by tune in. And so it's been really cool to be a part of that because, you know, when, when Sirius XM launched big 12 radio, here's experienced broadcasters that are like, all right, let's just go do a talk show and boom and let's start and let's go. But we had an opportunity to really take a step back with tune in and, reimagine what radio could be which in some ways is not you know anything different than what it's been but there's just a lot of different things you can do within there that i think we've changed and adapted and grown with so um you know super excited that big 12 radio didn't die i think from you know a massive audience standpoint there's still a ton of people that are huge fans of the conference that want to consume content um but yes i mean sirius xm essentially ended live content on the big 12 and and the ACC and perhaps soon the big 10, it'll just be sec live content. And that's a, a good investment for them to make, I guess, because there's so much attention being paid to this paid to the Southeastern conference, but it left opportunities for other conferences to partner with other platforms where there's still a ton of massive fans there. And you bring up a good point. Like, yeah, if a lot of my listeners aren't necessarily listening to this for sports, but I like to talk about the understory. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the media side and also the understory on why sports matter from like an entertainment standpoint. Um, I love the visual you give talking about West Virginia playing Arizona state. Like <laughs> I, I, I think for kids in school, that'd be a worthwhile home and away to do just cause the tailgate culture clash would be so big. I think they call it uh, they call it, I think at Arizona state, they call it, I think they do techno tailgates, which is, <laughs> <laughs> Got to be the exact opposite, the opposite of what they're doing in Morgantown. Yeah, like in Appalachia, you know, like <laughs> the West yeah. Virginia mountains. Like, yeah, it's it's it is crazy. Um, and that's again, I mean, Cal and SMU are on the Atlantic Coast Conference now. You know, I live in Dallas. I, I'm here to tell you that we're not really close to any any coasts. Well, save for the Gulf Coast, which is still about an eight hour drive. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's. First of all, like the branding of these conferences is a joke unto itself. You know, the Big 12 had 12 teams, then they had 10, and then they were back to 12, but now to 16. I think, you know, it was foolish. And, and, and then there's this idea, well, there's such a large brand power for the Big 12. They can't shift the name, which I think is foolish. So, like, or just maybe, like, forget about, you know, geography, forget about numbers and come up with other conference names. Um, I actually thought it was kind of smart that the Big 12 has toyed with the idea of selling the naming rights for the conference, you know, and if you are the big 12 and this is in some ways where the rubber meets the road, Adam, when it comes to, you know, revenue opportunities, you know, the big 12, the ACC, they're, they're at a massive disadvantage right now in terms of this um, hierarchy of money and revenue, right? Like, like, you know, the, this is sort of in the weeds, but I think it's important to note here, you know, the SEC, and the big 10 are taking in about twice as much television revenue uh, per year than the big 12 and the ACC twice as much every year. So think about that. It compounds every much year. each like the big 12 and the ACC are kind of by themselves. And then if you multiply both those times two, you'd get about the size of the big 10 or yeah. Or combined. Of the, no. To, so okay, like, cool. so the big 12 is somewhere between let's say 35 and 40 million and the SEC and the big 10 are somewhere between 80 to a hundred million per school in terms of yearly television revenue. Right. So the big 12 of the ACC are at a massive disadvantage here, right? Because this is all about money, you know, money and resources. So they have to figure out ways that they can make up for that revenue shortfall without exposing themselves to revenues that the other conferences can then take. Right. So 
it, it's it's one thing to come up with other ideas for where the revenue is going to come from. But then the SEC, as soon as they see you do that, they can also take that. So you have to be creative in like, what would we do that the SEC would never do? Naming rights is probably one of them. That's where there's also been talk about potential investment, um, you know, from outside investors, from private equity. Mm-hmm. That's not something the SEC is, is going to do. It's probably not something the Big 12 should do. But you have to look at it because you've got to look at revenue streams that the other conferences aren't going to do. Because remember, you're trying to make up for twice as much revenue per year. And so anything you add that they can add, it it, it doesn't help yeah. at all. In fact, they can probably add it at a larger amount. So it's only going to make for a larger shortfall. Yeah, it's kind of like um, we're creating like a college sports conference hunger games right now. I, I, I remember, no, by the way, there's no doubt about that. That is, exa- or a game of Thrones. You, I mean, yeah. there's like, is very much one of those two for sure. In some ways it's hunger games. In some ways it's game of Thrones. One of my good buddies from college, his brother was um, on the Butler basketball team. And then shortly after an assistant coach and in like a three year period of time, they jumped conferences twice. They were in the, no one's going to know this, but the <laughs> horizon league. Yeah. And then briefly they're in the Atlantic 10 and then they went to the big East and like just in that time, how different the player experience was. I, I think they were always Nike, but they, they're, they're definitely where they definitely started wearing way nicer stuff. You know, they started flying from buses to commercial to private jets. I don't know if that's exactly true, but just to be illustrated. Totally. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. the type of stuff that happens when these conferences and the, with the TV money. Well, and, and then, so extrapolate that even further, because this is, you know, the, the butlers of the world, that's formerly what's known as the group of five. So you now have sort of the SEC of the Big Ten at the top. That's the top of the food chain. And then you've got the Big 12 of the ACC, which is sort of like a second level. Remember, the Pac-12 doesn't exist anymore. It's just Washington State, Oregon State, because the rest of the Pac-12 fled. And then you've got the rest of those leagues. So there's like, there's multiple tiers now to it. And then, so when you when you extrapolate that further, think about all the other sports and an athletic department. So, you know, formerly and really still, but it's, it's even, you know, magnified further, you know, there, there's some socialism happening within college campuses insofar as football makes the majority of the money for the entire athletic department. And so Mm -hmm. then that is shared amongst the rest of the athletic department. And so most of these athletic departments are actually, they're not operating. They're operating at a deficit because all of the monies that they're taking in for the most part is just based on football and they're going to lose money in most other sports. And so for a lot of these athletic departments, not the SEC or the Big Ten and most of these Big 12 or ACC schools, but everybody else, they're going to operate at a deficit because they can't make up for all of that money. So we're so that's going to impact golf and mm-hmm. swimming and track and field. But at like Alabama, so they have all this money to take and football is making all this money so they can then reinvest that. So like Alabama recently, Justin Rose, who's a, is a pretty famous, um, or rather Justin Thomas, if you excuse me, is, is won some, some majors and is a pretty big PGA t- golfer. You know, he's, he went to Alabama. So he basically designed a golf course and a practice facility for them that they obviously could invest in. Like Butler can't do that. Not even Kansas can do that. Milo Mater at the big 12 level, right? So th- th- this is going to become more strategic, Adam, in terms of where you invest. So. It's funny because we've all existed in a capitalist world here, and yet college athletics is waking up, opening their eyes for the first time ever to capitalism because that's what this is, right? It's like, oh, now we have to make sound investments within our portfolio in order to get the right money back in those investments. Before, it was like we're investing all these sports because it's the right thing to do, and you're getting education for all these kids. And that is all true, but that's not how it is anymore. Now it's pursuit of profits at all costs. So it is very much a capitalist endeavor now. And so what you have – is you have to make, especially if you are under the SEC and the Big Ten, strategic investments in the sports that you want to be good in. Because if you're not, you're going to be you're not going to be successful. So it's it's football is obviously at the top of that. But any other sport, if you want to be good at baseball, if you want to be good at softball, if you want to be good at golf, if you want to be good at track and field, you have to invest in that way more so than you previously had been. Because it takes so much more money in order to operate those programs. Because look at what the SEC and the Big Ten are able to do. So, you know, it, it's, it's sort of extra, if you extrapolate that out, it's, it's impacting all sports across the board in terms of like, now look at what golf golf for a while didn't exist in the same space as football, but now in some programs it will. It's fascinating to think about the impact of sports. Like, even if you don't watch sports, like it's, 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 you just can't deny the impact it's having on colleges. Like, 
you know, 10, 15 years ago, no one went to Alabama or Oregon unless you were from that area of the country. And now I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Like my mom says that she hears all the time about people going to Alabama and Ole Miss. And a lot of it's around like football, football and Instagram really are the big two. It's insane. Like Alabama, Nick Saban, the former coach of Alabama, who's this is his first year not coaching them in multiple decades or a decade plus. You know, like I, I remember seeing this this thing where they they saw the the enrollment in foreign exchange students from Asia went up like seven thousand percent over the course of Nick Saban's tenure. And and so so they talk about sports being kind of the front porch of a university, right? Like it's it's your entry point. It definitely mm-hmm. you see a dramatic increase in, in, you know, in, in, in enrollment and, you know, even in, 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 in applications, but like what, what the Asian number says is not only is sports a front porch, but look at what the amount of revenue that sports brought in was able to do to all these other departments from an educational standpoint that then made Alabama more attractive to Asian students within specific programs. Those Asian students weren't all attracted to the Alabama football program. In fact, many of them may not even have known that they had a football program, but it was the educational departments that they were able to invest in because of Saban. They call it Sabanomics. I mean, the impact that Saban had on Tuscaloosa as a whole in terms of like the value of houses in Tuscaloosa for the university and the education. Like, I think they said it before Saban got there, like the average ACT score was like a 23, 24. <sighs> and now it's like a 28, 26. So it's just like incredible to see how much it's had in terms of the raising the profile of the academic side of the university. You talk a little bit about the good karma side and like what some, like what brands, like what kind of partnerships you guys are building. Yeah, so so good karma brands uh, for for other reference is uh, we own radio stations across the country, mostly ESPN radio stations um, in New York, LA, Chicago, as well as West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, um, and so. What I do in there is I uh, work with ESPN radio stations, New York, LA, and Chicago with the Lakers and Rams, USC, as well as the Kings, mm-hmm. um, the, the White Sox and Bears in Chicago, and then the New York Knicks and New York Rangers. And so I am, I'm working with each of those stations with their market manager, with their sales manager to come up with strategies on how to expand um, our footprint within those areas, how to get affiliates. So I'm looking in, let's say in California, I'm looking for affiliates for the Lakers in Bakersfield and in San Diego and at Oxnard, Ventura, and you know, it's, it, wherever I can get them in Chicago, I'm looking for bears affiliates in Peoria and in Des Moines and wherever I can get them where there's fans of those teams that want to have access to listening to those games. And, and in New York is the same. And, you know, so you see in th- this, that side, it's the first role I've had in radio. That's not on air. But it's really interesting because you get to see more of the business side of things, especially when it comes to, you know, consumption of sports, media habits. You know, a big part of what we do is share our data and information with affiliates to help them better sell. So it's a lot of it like how do you sell sports, sports talk and and, and sports uh, play by play rights, um, which to me uh, and the research indicates and it doesn't take it, you know, a rocket scientist to figure out that right now there's better been greater value in live play-by-play sports. Why is that? Because it's, it's live and you have to listen and watch live. There's nothing else in, in content that you have to consume live, Mm -hmm. live sports is it. And so that's why, I mean, look at the NFL right now. The NFL is so straddled across so many different platforms. I mean, you've got to have traditional television with Fox and CBS and NBC and ESPN. And then you've got to have Netflix. Now Netflix is in on the NFL. They're going to have a game. Amazon prime has Thursday night football. You've got to have Peacock because they're going to have a playoff game and they're going to have regular season games. So, I mean, not only do you have to have all of the channels themselves, but you have to then have the, 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 the subscriptions to all these, you know, all these other platforms. So why is that? Because the demand is so high. The fact that Netflix sees that value in live play-by-play sports and has invested billions of dollars in it. The fact that Amazon has invested billions of dollars in it. We see Apple TV have the MLS and Major League Baseball package. Like all these platforms that are in constant pursuit of the best content are all going after live sports content because they see the value in it. And from a radio perspective, it's huge. Number one, because, well, while you have to have all of these platforms and all of these subscriptions in order to get access to the NFL or to major league baseball, whatever, 
for radio, it's one place for free every week. And again, it is a live captive audience. And when it comes to radio, there's very much a passive listenership with radio. When you're listening in the car, listening to music and you're in your thoughts and you're thinking about other things, when you're listening to a podcast like this one and you want to pay attention or you're listening, so you're listening to spoken word or even more so if you're listening to a game and you're really engaged in that game, you have to be actively listening to that game to hear what's happening in the game. And so You've got short commercial breaks, which is huge for the the advertiser in that way. And so when you go to break, it's like they're listening to the break. They're listening to the commercials because they have to be because they have to be listening to make sure that when they come back from break, they're not missing that big fourth down play that was preceded that that timeout that led to um, that commercial break. So it's it's just just never been a better time for live sports because of the way that it commands a live active listenership audience. Are, are there people that are predicting a shift back to radio as people get sick of like these different subscriptions and also um, just like the monthly cost of accumulating subscriptions? Is that something that people are thinking? Yeah. And and honestly, probably not too far off to think like the cable bundle too, right? I mean, it, it, it you know, people have a certain amount of disposable income. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it may increase as more people get more money, but for the most part, like that's pretty set. And so you're not like, you can't just keep adding platforms. That's the reason yep. why many, you know, it was announced recently like ESPN and CBS and, and Turner are all, all combining to give you one app with all the sports. And it's like 50 bucks a month. And that seems very excessive. So we'll see like, you know, as it becomes more fragmented, do we get more partnerships that bring back more of the cable bundle? You know, it, 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 it's sort of ironic as bring it full circle back to talking about college, because it's like, I saw there's, there's like these memes. that's like, if only we could group these teams together in a geographical sensical <laughs> location, you know, like, man, it would make way more sense for Cal and Stanford to play each other and maybe to play like USC and UCLA. Like, would wouldn't that make more sense geographically? You know, like maybe we could group all these teams together. So, and, and it's like, that's, the reinvention of the cable bundle is exactly probably what's happening too. But I, I think radio as well, to your point. I mean, when you think about like where we are in our lives versus like where kids are coming out of college, right? Their money's way more expensive now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the path to buying a home, home ownership is really, really difficult with more with interest rates where they are. And, you know, they're certainly not going to get to where they were when a few years ago when they were at 3% or sub 3%, right? So everything's more expensive. So, if you're a post college grad, you know, to get to be able to consume live sports for free um, on the radio, absolutely. There's tons of value there. And I think when you look at like a tune in, sort of the evolution of, you know, the app versus radio and, and the programmatic side of things, like there's, there's definitely some, some areas we can sort of predict the future is going back to what it had been in a lot of capacities, you know, the, the cable bundle, the conferences and, and, uh, and radio too. You mentioned some of the brand deals. I remember a big statement was when Amazon bought the rights to Thursday night football, one game a week for like a billion dollars. What have you learned about how brands and companies are evaluating these sort of deals? Because they're certainly um, nonlinear and they're part of a bigger picture than just what they're initially investment investing in. Yeah, I mean, just just take a minute to like really marinate in what you just said. Like Amazon paid a billion dollars, a bookstore, an online bookstore <laughs> <laughs> paid a billion dollars for one, one football game a week. And there's only 16 of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. So like they don't have a playoff game that have mm-hmm. a one football game a week. They paid a billion dollars. And it's like, I mean, Amazon has the money, right? Apple has the money, but I think the fact that they've now invested shows you just how important that programming is, right? This is not, you know, they talk about sports teams, like rich people buy sports teams. is like a novelty. It's like, look at, look at me, right? Like it's, it's imperative for your programming in order to have that as a draw. You know, we, we think about like shows being a draw for some of these platforms and people can come and go from those platforms based on the shows that are available. But if you have sports that people are going to consume, and I think I saw a study recently that was done by, it was, it was Group M that says that like 66% of Americans are sports fans. That's an insane wow. number. <laughs> 
it's an insane number of people. There's 350 million Americans, right? So 66% of them are, are sports fans. So, you know, I, I think when, when, if you're a platform that has content and you're going to constantly look, how do we keep people paying premium subscription fees every month? That's what sports will do. Um, and then from a, from brand standpoint, I think you were, you were touching on this in terms of like advertising, right? Like why a brand would get involved. Um, I think again, wh where are people most going to consume your messaging in a, in a, you know, in a, like number one, that it's going to get through. Right. So, I mean, so many of these shows, you're not watching commercials anymore. So, I mean, live sports is the one place where you've got to sit through and have to watch commercials. And again, the fact remains like it's active listenership. It's active watching. You can't, you know, if there's a big play coming up, you're not going to leave the TV. You're not going to get up. So these people are sitting on the couch on a Sunday. These people, myself, <laughs> I'm sitting at a couch on a Saturday to Sunday for hours on end. And I'm not getting up and I'm watching your message. So you're messaging. And so that's why I think brands, they're paying a premium price for it because everybody's paying a premium price for it, right? If you're paying a billion dollars in your Amazon to, to get one game per week, what are you, what are you having to charge in your inventory throughout the game in order to try to make that money back? The reality is you're not, you're not like ESPN and their deal with the NFL. Just do the math. You can't make that money back. You're not making that money back. <laughs> it's yeah. impossible. You're making it back through subscribers. And ultimately what you're thinking is it's a loss leader for me. I mean, that literally is the story of how Fox got in on the NFL in the first place. They knew based on, and this is years ago, but they knew based on the economics, they were going to lose money on it, but it was a good loss leader for them because it was a flagpole for them in terms of their content. And I mean, you go back and look like th maybe the biggest piece that Fox ever did in terms of their growth and their success was get the NFL and get involved in the NFL. That story is incredible. You mentioned 66% of Americans, a, a, an alarmingly high number are sports fans in some capacity. Why do you think sports are so powerful and mean so much to people? It's a great question, Adam. So, I mean, it, it's, I guess, let me throw it back to you and, and to the audience. I mean, think about that for a second. Uh, so let's just say seven out of 10 people listening to this are sports fans in some capacity. That's basically what that number tells us or six, six point six out of 10. Right. Why do you, why do you think it? Why do you think answer your own question, Adam? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. I, I don't watch very many sports. Like I, I try to like get one college football Saturday, one pro football Sunday, like per year, I'll watch some NBA playoffs like the Dallas Mavs series and such. But like day in, day out, I'm I'm not on Barstool. I'm not on Twitter in getting in arguments with people like you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't watch that much sports on a daily basis. I do do some work with a nonprofit out of Dallas that's in the sports space. For me, I believe that people have a desire to pursue their potential and for greatness and they all, we also have a desire for competitiveness, healthy competitiveness. I also think there's identity dynamics in play and sports in many ways fuels those things. You know, there, we get to feel like when you're watching like a March madness game, when it's late and it's tight, like, like I'm on the edge of my seat, like I'm nervous, you know, and there's something really exciting about that. Um, you know, when it comes to identities, it, it, you know, I remember going to the Ohio State Buckeye games and getting chills when the band comes out or my my good friend says, try going to a, a college basketball game and not being happy, not be happy. So I think there's something with the energy, the excitement. And I think it fuels some of our human desire for greatness, potential um, and competitiveness. My qualm with it is that it's an outsource model. Whereas I, I believe everyone should, in addition to getting it through sports, should be pursuing those things in their own lives. Yeah, that's a great, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in there, Adam. I mean, like, like first off, there's no wrong answer here. Yeah. Because totally. there's a ton of reasons for why sports is so compelling. Um, I mean, I think what you've hit on is, is so rich and important. Like it's, it's the last true meritocracy within our society, right? Like it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, where you come from. Like if you are good enough, you can do it like every other industry, like certainly. Yeah. But for the most part, who do you know? And like, yeah. totally like it is the last true merit. How good are you? And you you're able to, to lift yourself up. Now, again, we can get into the subtleties of like, 
yep. travel Back baseball, everything football else. Football is like that. Baseball, maybe a little bit less, but yeah, right, we're all tracking. Right. right, for sure. Okay, I mean, the emotional component of it to me is the biggest component of it, and it's it's emotional is a broad scope in terms of sports interest, but like fandom is passed down from generation to generation. You know, I'm a Chicago sports fan. I'm a huge Chicago White Sox fan because my dad was a huge Chicago White Sox fan. Now, his dad was a Cub fan, but 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 like the Bears, another good example, right? Like generation upon generation of my family and my friends' families, they pass down that from generation. So it's it's a shared experience where you can sit there in a living room you know, with your dad and your uncle and your cousin and your brother and your sister and your aunt and, you know, and every, and your grandmother and everybody is living and dying with every play. The other part of that shared experience is like, it brings you closer to friends you never knew you had, right? Like that emotional yeah. connection immediately with somebody because they have the same sports fandom as you, you know, you might be out in public and you, you see a, a somebody wearing an Ohio state hat and you're like, I went to Ohio state and you're like, Hey, but you know, go Buckeyes yeah. or, I went to Kansas. If I see somebody wearing a Kansas shirt, I'll say like rock chalk Jayhawk, right? Like that's, so I think just that emotional shared connection, you know, I think there's a lot of nostalgia in sports, right? We think about when we first went to games and we went to games, you know, it's funny because people obviously remember the wins and losses, but you don't, you don't over time. You just remember the games you went to and the pe people you had and the experiences, the fun you had, you won't even remember the outcome of these games. It's all about the outcomes. And yet when you get like far removed from it, five, six, seven years down the road, you don't even forget it. You don't even remember if they won or lost. Um, so I, I, there really is no wrong answer here. I would say what you've identified as a huge part of it. I think the emotional connection is a huge part of it. Um, you know, and that's you know, more than anything, what, 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 uh, what draws people in and keeps people coming back. Yeah. Uh, um, a couple about, about last year, I, I like, I, my, I can walk directly on the sidewalk from my house. I live in Austin, Texas on the East side. And, uh, I was locking up and my neighbor was locking up too. I'd never met him before. And he was like, Hey, how's it going? And kind of arms length distance. And he, I was like, here's a, where he went to school or asked him where he went to school. And he goes, oh, I went to this school in Ohio. And I was like, I went to this school in Ohio too. Which one did you go to? And find out we both went to Miami university and <laughs> everything shifted. And I think a lot of times, especially if you're in a different city, like, meeting a, a shared sports fan is can be like that. I want to talk a little bit about getting into this sports industry, uh, starting with your story. How did you get into this sports talk radio, radio affiliate management world? Yeah, I mean, you you really have to be relentless, you know, in your pursuit. And you have to do that in really anything you do. But certainly if you want to be in an industry that has a lot of demand. Um, and so, you know, I... Everybody who works in media um, probably has a different story, but, you know, do they start in a big market? Do they start in a small market? You know, how'd they, how'd they get a break? Whatever. For me, I mean, I started small market radio. Um, I got an opportunity uh, after moving to Austin. Um, you know, I lived in Austin, Texas for a few years. I currently live in Dallas. So you and I aren't too far. Um, but for me, it was the experience that I got being a radio host you know, being on the radio every day in small town, Missouri was so instrumental for my success long-term. Now I didn't know it at the time and it was really tough because it's the pay is very low hours are long. And, um, you know, and your, your country music DJ, you go to four H conventions. I mean, I grew up in Chicago and never even knew what a four H convention was before I moved to Missouri, but you know, you're learning a lot of new things. You're learning a lot about yourself. You're learning about how to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, that experience I got in Missouri, propelled me to the success that I had in Austin, uh, even though I didn't have a job when I moved to Austin, but kind of just worked my way in with a relentless pursuit of an opportunity there where I just wanted to put myself in position. That's the one thing, the advice I always give, like for people, like if you want to be on air as a radio host or a TV, whatever, you know, then do it, right? Find somebody that's going to put you on air and do it and then go, you know, and then try to move, move your way up and do it. Like if you want to, 
back your way to a sales job that might get me on air. No, no, no. Just go be on air. Go find somewhere they're going to put you on air and keep doing it and keep getting better because those reps that you're getting every day being on air are so instrumental to your long-term success. So, you know, by the time I got to Austin without a job, I was sort of able to work myself into a job pretty quickly because I had that experience being on air every day. And I was comfortable and confident that none of these other guys that were trying to graduate from Texas had, right? They graduated from the journalism school, the radio, TV, film program at, at Austin. Great great program at the university of Texas, but like they didn't have that real life experience of being on air every day. And so I bypassed all of them. And then that led to an opportunity in San Antonio where I was the, the program director, which is essentially you know, overseeing all the programming for the radio station. I was a show host there as well. And then, um, and then again, I bet on myself when I moved to Dallas, I had the opportunity to host the, the Dallas Cowboys pregame and postgame show, uh, which was awesome and a really cool experience uh, that I did for five years, but I didn't have any other long-term full-time employment. That was just seasonal. That was just during the season. And so I, you know, had just right place, right time, right experiences to get launched Sirius XM Big 12 radio. And, uh, and then, you know, again, here recently when Big 12 radio shut down at Sirius XM and didn't know what was going to happen next, was I going to move? Was I going to go somewhere else? And um, TuneIn came along and relaunched uh, Big 12 radio. And so, you know, you, you've got to kind of, you need to, you need some luck for sure. And anybody that's listening to this, that's had any success in any industry that they're in, um, there's luck involved, but it's that, it's that combination of, when the, you know, when preparation meets luck, great things happen. And that, that's really what it is. I mean, you're, you need to catch breaks in life in order to get things to go your way, but it's, are you prepared to leverage that break when you get it for the best, you know, for the best of your ability to, to for the best of the opportunity. Do you have any good, um, or stories you look back on from on air experience? I'd imagine there's gotta be a couple of oh, so great, many. crazy scenarios with the Cowboys. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, I, it's funny. I think back at some of my biggest mistakes, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Uh, uh. but yeah, I mean, there, you know, there, there've been, um, a lot of crazy situations that I, I mean, I had a, you know, I had a co-host once that, um, basically fought was fighting with a, a guest we had, uh, in person off air, but it was like a, a fight that started on air that they both took their microphones off and started going after each other. At a live air. event. After a Cowboys game at a live event. Yeah. Yeah. During the post game show of the Cowboys. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, my, like my funniest, I'm an idiot story is, uh, and this happens in, you know, in, in, when you're kind of a one man band, you know, but, uh, I covered the Spurs when they went to the NBA finals. I was in the building when, uh, wow. Ray Allen hit the shot to beat the Spurs mm -hmm. in, in South beach, um, and then the year, the next year when the Spurs beat them, but that year, uh, when Ray Allen knocked him knock the Spurs out with that three. That's you know one of the most memorable threes in the history of the NBA. Um, I interviewed RC Buford one day in South beach after practice, RC Buford is the general manager of the Spurs, very well-known, you know, basketball brain. And I mean, he basically put together the, the, the Spurs team that the core of the Spurs team that won five titles um, over the course of a decade. And so I did this interview It was a great interview. It was probably like 10, 15 minutes. And then I'm, I'm, I'm leaving to get out. You know, we were kind of the last ones in the gym at that point. I leave to get out. I look at my phone and I didn't press record. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> didn't so, press record. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that happens. And um, these guys, yeah. like these kinds of things happen, you know? Yeah. 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 I went, that's funny. You mentioned that Ray Allen shot uh, a couple of years ago. I was on a plane and I was sitting next to this guy and he was like looking at this paper that just had a bunch of players names. And I was like, Hey, I had to ask like, what do you do? Like, why are you like looking at right, all these... right. And he was an agent. And at the time, and I asked him his, his, um, tops moment in his agent career. And he said he was Ray Allen's agent. And, uh, that shot was the top moment of his agent's career. That was such an unbelievable experience. So, I mean, it famously Miami fans left the building cause they were about to lose. And so yep. where they had the media, they had the media way upstairs at the top because, you know, throughout the course of a regular season, you're going to have media, you know, at closer levels. But the, the further you get in the playoffs, the further up the media gets, you know, because there's obviously more media that wants access. And so I'm with a buddy of mine who we were working together from San Antonio. We're like, the Spurs are about to win a title. We need to get downstairs so we can get on the floor when they win. And so we were racing down these escalators and, and like we're going against like we're the salmon swimming upstream. You've got all these people in white shirts. They're all very ticked off. They're all very upset. And you're like trying to make your way against the grain uh, against all these people. And we're trying to get down. So you eventually get down and we were underneath 
like the stanction where the, they set up the pre and post game show on ESPN. And I was standing there with Brett Barry of all people. And we look up and it was like, Oh, the Spurs about to do this. And you look up and Ray Allen hits that shot. It was like, Oh no. And then at that point I wasn't going to go back up because that was, they went to overtime after that shot. And so I was like, I wasn't supposed to be down there. Like we had no access to being down there. We were just like, let's quickly make our way there. And then we can get on the floor and it'll be over. So we sat right next to Mickey Arison's courtside suite is the owner at the time of the Miami heat along with Lonzo morning. We were just kind of standing there and I was like covering up my media badge. Cause I knew that we weren't supposed to be there. And eventually like somebody from the NBA, like pushed us out. was like, you have to get it. it was like very aggressive with us. You have to get out of here. And so we had to watch like the rest of overtime from a TV underneath basically like standing five feet away. We could hear the reaction in live time and then watching the rest of it, it, it on TV. It was uh, it was a crazy experience. It was like this whirlwind of like just trying to push and make our way to get these good spots, just be able to watch the rest of the game. And it was like, you're not supposed to be here. Shoving me out of the way. It's incredible. That's an, I, those are iconic videos of the, the fans racing out. It's always amazing how like the fandom reflects the culture of the city. That's a great example yep. for Miami. I remember I went to the a USC football game they were playing number three utah they actually won it was years ago and um no one was there no one was in the coliseum until like 15 minutes into the game <laughs> just crazy Did well, you I, have- I, I, let me and let me just give a little bit of credit to miami fans by taking away credit from all other american sports fans to be honest with you like american sports fans are very fickle it's mm-hmm. the truth of the i mean it in and certainly there are some cities that are better than others but like i remember i went to a buddy's bachelor party in Montreal once. And we went, we wanted to go to a Canadians game. It was the last game of the regular season. Montreal was in last place. It was the last game of the regular season. And the game was sold out. We had to, we had to buy tickets from somebody outside for like twice as much money as they were going face value. You go to any stadium in America, the last day of the regular season with the team in last place. And you, they are giving away tickets. There's no demand for those. So it, it, like hockey fans in Canada, soccer fans in Europe, there's just nothing that touches that type of fandom. We're kind of spoiled as, as American sports fans to have all these different seasons with all these different teams, but we're fickle, man. We're all fickle. And some are more fickle than others than Miami sports fans and LA sports fans get that tag. But man, all American sports fans are very fickle. Do you ever have a chance? I mean, San Antonio is a small market. Did you ever go to any of those coach pop wine dinners? <laughs> no, but I mean, pop... <laughs> Pop was an interesting, I mean, he's an interesting cat. I think he's one of the greatest American sports coaches of all time, but he's, you know, he's a dick. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no other way to say it. He goes after the media for sport. Um, there are times where you would know like, okay, he's going to be pissed. And then he wasn't like close loss. You think, oh, he's going to be so bad. He was like in a great mood. And then they'd have like a blowout win and he'd be in the worst mood ever. So it was tough to predict. And then, yeah, you know, there are certain times where people ask bad questions and he'd go after them. And there are yeah. certain times where he just wasn't going to allow, he just wasn't going to, you know, he was just weren't going to answer a question. He just wasn't going to answer any of your questions. So, um, and it's funny because he's like a champion, a little guy, you know, like he's always talking about all these people that are underrepresented or under all oh, these. And yet at the same time, he's like hunting media members for sport. It's like, it's, it's sort of ironic, but no, I mean, he's, uh, he is, he is, I say all that to say like he is to me and I grew up in Chicago during the nineties bulls. Like he's the greatest coach in the history of the NBA, not wow. red Auerbach, not Phil Jackson, because like red, you know, with all due respect to the great red Auerbach, like he had bill Russell. Okay. And Phil had Jordan and the triangle offense and he, ne- and then he had Kobe in the triangle offense. Like he never really evolved. If you look at the way in which Greg Popovich evolved over the course of his career as a head coach, which where they won their first championships, dumping the ball into Tim Duncan, letting him go to work to where they won that championship against Miami, a completely different, you know, move, ball movement oriented team. You know, if, if you are one that likes leadership and likes to look at good leadership, and I've listened to your podcast and before, so I know that there's probably a lot of people like that listening here, study Greg Popovich and leadership. I don't think there's anybody better that checks off more boxes in terms of leadership than Greg Popovich. So, you know, Pop as a coach, he, he's so good about caring about the person more than the athlete and how that athlete can help them, which is such an easy thing to say and not an easy thing to do. I remember walking um, at the NBA finals one of those years, he would walk around and be talking to the players as they're stretching. And he walks past Tim Duncan and he walks past Manu Ginobili. And there he is spending five, 10 minutes talking to 
a bench warmer that has not played the entire NBA finals. And then he gets up and he, you know, he daps up Tony Parker. And then he goes and spends another five, 10 minutes talking to somebody else deep on the bench that, you know, hasn't played very much. He is so good at engaging the entire roster to make them feel important and impactful. And I think part of that is just in general, like good leadership, but then also he's empowering guys across the entire roster because he's asking for their input. Hey, what do you think I should do here? What do you think about that? And when you're keeping those guys engaged, you don't know. At some point, you may have to call on them in order to play at a big moment. And if they're not engaged, if they're at the back of that bench and you hadn't ever asked them about anything or engaged them in any way, they're not going to be ready to go. Like they will be physically ready to go, but not emotionally ready to perform at the level you need to perform them at. So he was constantly keeping guys fresh mentally by engaging them all the time in ways that when he called on them, they were ready to perform from an active, I'm engaged. I, I know I'm going to be called upon. Like that's a mental thing. It's a mental hurdle you have to get over. If you're an NBA player, you're a professional athlete, you're not playing a lot. You check out. So pop, mm-hmm. figure out ways to keep those guys engaged. And it worked because there were times where he was going to need those guys and he went to them and they were ready to play and perform at high levels, opposed to the same guy with the same makeup in terms of, of the physical structure and even the mental makeup. If you're not engaging him constantly, they're not going to, they're not going to perform. Cause they're going to feel like well, he doesn't need me. He never needed me until now. So there's no confidence that that person has in, in trying to perform at that level. Yeah. You bring up a good point. It's just like <clears throat> why sports can be so impactful. It's just, you get such a quick feedback loop, you know, the season's long, but it's not that long. And every week's a performance. So you get to see some of these leadership lessons, both on the field and on the sidelines in action all the time. Right. No. And there's a scoreboard. Yeah, You know, when I host a radio show after the show's over, I don't see a scoreboard to see who won the game, you know? So, so many of us that are, whatever we do, we have to come up with ways to, to figure out what that scoreboard looks like in our own capacity. But you're right. The, the feedback loop, and obviously that can get even more destructive now with social media to where like, you've got guys that are yeah. looking at their phones in the middle of halftime during a game. Like that's inconceivable to me. That is inconceivable to me. Like for me during a show, I try to look at my phone to see what, what sometimes people are saying or give me feedback, but like you're a high level athlete, a pro athlete making millions of dollars. And you care what other people think in the middle of a game. Yeah. There's so much more we could talk about. I mean, yeah. I, when you say that, I, I think about the one Harrison Barnes found out he got traded during a game, like <laughs> <laughs> insane. insane. Um, are you been so generous with your time and there's a lot we've covered on like how sports and media is changing and, and why it all matters. What's the best way for people to keep up with you and the work you're doing? Yeah, check me out on Twitter uh, or X. Uh, I won't uh, call it Twitter until Elon holds a gun in my head and makes me call it Twitter but or X, but uh, at RE Sports, A-R-I Sports. Uh, same on Instagram as well, A-R-I Sports. And download the TuneIn app and um, favorite Big 12 radio and check out my show, 7 to 10 a.m. Central. Awesome. We'll, we'll have links to all those in the show notes, Ari. And thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for asking me, Adam. This was a lot of fun. Take care. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Morrissey. That conversation was with Ari Temkin. Ari is a longtime sports radio host, as well as the affiliate manager for brand partnerships for LA, Chicago, and New York sports teams. What I enjoyed about the episode was talking about how sports and media is changing, and most importantly, why it matters. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, and we'll see you here soon. Thanks. 